So I thought, I thought this idea that, that Roe is actually pretty good was new to me. And, and the points about, about uh, individual liberty um, was, was I didn't know. And then, of course, I, I, you know, the right to privacy has always been troubling because, you, you know, right to privacy, there's no real right to privacy. Um, but, hey, I'll take a right to privacy over no rights. <laughs> so if, if you can justify uh, protecting my freedom... Uh, through privacy, then I'll take that over never justifying, my, you know, not not being willing to protect my freedoms at all. Um, so that was that was I thought was really interesting. I had read, I think I read the draft of Dobbs. I didn't read the final uh, decision. I thought the I thought Dobbs was awful. Uh, but then Ankar's convinced me it's even worse than I thought it was. Uh, it really is a bad decision. It's it's, and the conservatives are chewing this decision. This is what's spooky about it. It's not, it's, it's not just that these are supposedly really, really intelligent people. Like, I really think Gorsuch is really smart, right? I don't know about Alito. I'm suspicious. And, and, and this woman, Barrett, is, I mean, she's a Catholic cultist. She's not even just a Catholic, ordinary Catholic. She belongs to a cult within Catholicism. So she's a nutcase. But I thought Gorsuch was at least really, really smart. And Kavanaugh, I don't know. Uh, hard to tell Kavanaugh. But, uh, and, and Thomas, I think, is really smart. But... This decision is really bad. And then you get, you know, you get a lot of these um, constitutional scholars in, at law schools uh, who are pl applauding this decision, conservatives, right, applauding this decision. And I always thought originalism was suspicious and I didn't like the textualism, we need to study the text. But now this idea of, of history and we need to go, what were the common views at the time and and, uh, you know, what were the laws at the time? What are recognized rights at the time when this was written? And a lot of this is driven by a negative thing. A lot of it is driven by fear. And the fear is that if they recognize the idea of the Ninth Amendment, that idea of enumerated rights, and that we, we, can, we can even discover new rights because as technology changes, you might have right to things that you, wasn't imaginable. But if they do that, they're opening up the door to the left, saying, well, then I have a right to a job, and I have a right to food, and I have a right to, what was it, right, from, right to freedom from fear. Wasn't that one of uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, uh, three freedoms? Uh, I have a right to all these things. That is, they can't conceive, since they cannot conceive of an objective perspective on rights, they cannot conceive of the idea that rights uh, objective. They're not intrinsic. They're not in you. God has not placed them in you. Nature has not placed it in you. But they're objective. There's something we as human beings identify as necess a necessity of social interaction, of, of, of human life, a necessity that results from the nature of human beings, right? But it's objective. And now we can look at new phenomena and say, okay, it, is this a right or isn't there, is there a right to this or isn't there a right to this because we can take this principle of uh, you know freedom to act and free of coercion and we can use this principle to apply it to a variety of different concretes but it is an objective principle it does have a clear identity no see once they give up on their intrinsicism once they 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 recognize and this is true of the religionists once they recognize they cannot defend rights on the basis of religion they cannot defend, they can't write in, the, in their opinion, God did this and this and God, you know, and therefore we should, they can't write that. So they don't have what they perceive as the only defense of rights, which is an intrinsic defense of rights that coming from God. Since they cannot defend that, what are they left with? They were left with subjectivism. And there's the subjectivism on the left, the subject, their subjectivism, there's all this, and they're afraid of that. That scares them because they can't defend themselves against the left in that circumstances. So, as Hankar said, so instead of that, what do they revert to? The subjectivism of history. Whatever history did, that's okay. Whether they were right, whether they weren't, who are we to judge? Right? To judge, we would have to have an objective standard. We would actually ha know, have to know what rights are. And we can't do that, you know, unless we bring in religion and we're not allowed to do that. And even then, what do rights actually mean? God didn't actually tell us. Right? He gave, it, gave it them to us, but then forgot to tell us. There's no manual. He forgot to give us an instruction manual for the rights that he implanted in us. So they have this stuck. I mean, Ayn Rand always used to say intrinsicism at the end is always subjectivism. Right? The idea 
that knowledge is you get from revelation is subjectivism because there is no revelation. <laughs> so what do you, when, you, when you say God revealed this to me, what are you actually saying? I feel that. I, my, you know, I dreamt it, I had a delusion, I was in LSD, whatever. It's your emotion. There's no, since God didn't talk to you, since there is no God, then it, it, it all boils down at the end of the day to subjectivism. There's nothing, uh, there is nothing else. Um, so, uh, Sean's about here. There he is. All right, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. I thought he was here. Uh, is that two songs or one song? Are those two songs? Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's my. That's the $200. And T yeah, okay, now I get it. Oh, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. I actually like Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Um, cool. Finally, somebody's asked me to review a song from a group that I, A, know of, <laughs> B, actually like. So, um, uh, Teach Your Children is a song I like the music of. I don't remember the lyrics. I probably hate them. Maybe they're good. I don't know. Most rock songs, I hate the lyrics, and, but, but this one, I like, I like the music there. Um, all right, where were we? So yeah, so it's this escape. They can't use intrinsicism because it mean, means nothing. They're left with subjectivism. They, they're afraid to deal with their argument versus the left's argument in terms of what rights are because they probably lose because if you're subjectivist then everything, it opens up to everything. So the only way they can limit the scope of rights to what they emotionally feel is the right thing to do is by referring to history and they think they gain some objectivity there. Of course, even there, they, they, um, they, they pervert and distort the history because um, uh, this didn't come in, up in Ankar's talk, but it, it's interesting that they're using as the historical reference the 14th Amendment. So what they did was they looked at, in, in the Dobbs decision, they're using the 14th Amendment as the historical context. So they look at the laws and what was common in the culture in the, in, the, uh, in the 1960s, in the 1860s, right? In the 1860s America. And in the 1860s America, there were actually laws on the books criminalizing abortion. So that had been something that developed in the 19th century. What's interesting, though, is when the Constitution was written in 1789, there were very few laws on the books outlawing abortion. Indeed, common law coming from England viewed abortion as, as non-criminal if the woman would state that she had not felt the baby king yet. So if there was no, it's alive, vital, no vital signs, then there was no criminal prosecution. Um, and, and that was, came from, from common law from England. So if they'd used the standard of 1789, they would have had to say abortion should be legal until, I don't know, heartbeat, viability, something, right? Instead, by using the, the standards of which they cherry pick, right, 19, uh, 1863, 1860, whatever, whenever the 14th Amendment was written, uh, was ratified, 65 maybe, um, they get, to, they get to, 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 you know, not have any, any principle around abortion, uh, around abortion. What's interesting is the same court, same week, rules on guns. For its historical context, it uses... 1789, not uh, 1865. B again, they're using the 14th Amendment, which was written in 1865. But it's the, rule, the, the laws on the books in America are not convenient for their case in 1865. So they cherry pick the 1789, and now they're referring to the Constitution and not to the 14th Amendment. So they're cherry picking their history. They're not even really doing history. They're cherry picking. Uh, and of course, history changes, so you got to cherry pick. So when, wh what, is the, what is the generation that counts? What are the years that matter? Well, the years that are going to get me the answer that I want to get, which is the bottom line here. Um, and uh, so, I don't know. I, it, it's, I've got to do this talk on optimism on Thursday. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's very depressing when, you know, some of the smartest people there are, Supreme Court justices, they've done a lot, they've gone through a lot, they're obviously smart people, they've... And they don't get it. I mean, they don't get it. They don't understand. This is my sense of politicians. When I told you I used to visit congressmen, they just have no clue. They don't understand. And they have no concept. They can't think in principle. The, 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 there's no principles on which they really rely. 
they, they, they know their position on concrete issues, and then they, 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 in a sense, they build the law to justify those positions. And that's why we have today a court where these are conservatives, these are liberals. We know exactly how they're going to vote. We know exactly how they're going to vote. There's no, I mean, there are a few cases where you get some mixture, but generally it's clear cut. Why? Because there's no principles. So, it, you know, so it's not that there are no principles. It's that the outcome is already set in advance in their minds. And now they just write a ruling to justify it rather than struggling with the issue and figuring out and figuring out what it really means and what the answer really is. Um, so I, I, again, I, I recommend everybody uh, who hasn't heard Ankos talk uh, really um, listen to it, uh, watch it on YouTube whenever it comes out. Uh, it was really good, and it, I think it gave some new dimensions to the whole Dobbs case, and it, was, it, it depressed me further uh, than I was before. So it was more negative than, um, than even I thought the decision was, primarily because of how weak the whole process now is of, of making these decisions and, and, and describing them and, and uh, arguing for them. Uh, you know, they, they, they are, it's, it's not good. Thank you for listening or watching the Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening, you get value from watching, Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content. And of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are ready subscribers and those of you who are ready supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.